The next step the Prophet, peace be upon him, took was aimed at preserving the Muslim community from increasing belligerence. He had heard much about the king of Abyssinia, who was known to be a just Christian ruler, one who would allow no persecution in his land. The Prophet, peace be upon him, directed the Muslim community to migrate to Abyssinia and to take shelter there. The first batch of Muslims migrated in the month of Rajab, five years after Muhammad, peace be upon him, had become a prophet. Twelve men and four women made the journey across the Red Sea. Uthman bin Affan, may Allah be pleased with him, was the leader of the group, accompanied by his wife Ruqayya, one of the Prophet, peace be upon him's daughters. Their voluntary exile marked the first instance of a family migrating for religious reasons since the time of Ibrahim and Lut, peace be upon them. Late one night, the small group of immigrants slipped out of Makkah and made their way to Sheba, a port south of Jeddah. Fortunately, two cargo ships were present there. The group boarded a ship and sailed to Abyssinia. There they found the refuge they needed until Allah made it safe for them to return to Makkah. When the Quraysh found out that a group of Muslims had fled, they erupted in anger. They swiftly sent some men to bring them back to teach them such a lesson that they would recant their faith. However, the Quraysh reached the coast too late. The Muslims had already made their way out to sea. Tired and disappointed, the Quraysh returned to Makkah to begin plotting their next move. About two months after the migration to Abyssinia, the Prophet, peace be upon him, came to the Qaaba. A large number of the Quraysh were present and their chieftains and noblemen were sitting among them. The chapter of the Qur'an called Al-Najm had only recently been revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Suddenly, the Prophet, peace be upon him, rose before the Quraysh and began reciting the verses of Surah Al-Najm. The Quraysh kept quiet. No one there had ever heard such powerful words. They were bewildered. Muhammad, peace be upon him, their sworn enemy was standing before them, reciting, and they were left powerless. No one could stand to make him stop, and none could even ridicule him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, reached the closing verse and prostrated, putting his head to the ground in worship of Allah, Lord of the Universe. Prostrate before Allah and worship him. Quran 53, colon 62. Miraculously, all of the Quraysh were so overcome by the recitation that they prostrated along with him. Ibn Masud, may Allah be pleased with him, a companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him, reported that one of the Quraysh present that day, Umayyah bin Khalaf, took a handful of dust and rubbed it on his forehead, saying, This is enough for me. Ibn Masud would later see Umayyah killed during the Battle of Badr. News of how the Quraysh had prostrated after hearing the Prophet, peace be upon him, recite verses from the Qur'an reached the Muslims in Abyssinia. It was rumoured that the Quraysh had accepted Islam. Joyfully, they left Abyssinia and set sail for Arabia. Once they were just outside Makkah, however, they discovered that nothing had changed. The Quraysh was still opposed to Islam and Makkah was still a hostile territory. Disappointed, some decided to return to Abyssinia while others entered Makkah and found shelter with some sympathetic non-Muslims. Second Migration to Abyssinia Their prostration at the close of Surah Al-Najm had left the Quraysh looking weak. This loss of strength had to be countered with increased hostility or people would think they had become convinced of the truth of Muhammad, peace be upon him's message. Therefore, they began to intensify their persecution of the Muslims. Furthermore, the Quraysh were growing jealous of the hospitality the king of Abyssinia had extended to the Muslim immigrants in his country. They resolved to match his kindness to the Muslims with hostility. For reasons of safety, the Prophet, peace be upon him, decided to again have a group of Muslims migrate to Abyssinia. 82 or 83 men and 18 women got themselves ready for the journey. This time, of course, it would not be easy for them to slip past the Quraysh, but they managed to flee Makkah without their enemies noticing. The Quraysh found it difficult to accept the fact that a large group of Muslims had managed to escape their campaign of terror. Safe in Abyssinia, the Muslims now enjoyed the experience of not facing any opposition to their faith and way of life. The Quraysh, nonetheless, had a plan. They sent two of their very shrewd envoys, Amr bin al-As and Abdullah bin Rabi'ah, 
to Abyssinia to have the Muslims extradited back to Arabia. According to the plan, the two representatives of the Quraysh first met the Abyssinian bishops and bribed them in order to gain access to the king. When they succeeded in getting an audience with him, they presented him with gifts from Arabia. Then they stated their case. O king, some foolish men from our city have taken refuge in your majesty's country. They have abandoned our religion, but rather than accepting your religion, they have invented one of their own. Their families, knowing of their delusions, have sent us to your majesty to bring them back home. When they had made their plea to the king, the Abyssinian bishops stood and urged him to grant their request. The king, however, was a very fair judge. He said that he would allow both parties to make their statements before making a decision. The Muslim refugees were summoned to the king's court. Then the king questioned them why they had entered an unknown religion that had caused them to abandon their families and tribes. Jafar bin Abu Talib, the Prophet peace be upon him's cousin, rose on behalf of the Muslims and said, O king, we were a nation steeped in ignorance. We worshipped idols, ate carrion and committed many abominations. We neglected our kin and mistreated our neighbours. The strong among us devoured the weak. We lived thus until Allah raised among us a messenger of whose noble lineage, truthfulness, honesty and purity we were all aware. He invited us to acknowledge the oneness of God, to worship Allah and to renounce the stones and idols our forefathers we used to venerate. He enjoined upon us to speak the truth, to keep our word and to be kind and considerate to our relatives and neighbours. He forbade us to shed blood, to act wantonly, to lie and to deceive others. He forbade us to encroach upon the property of orphans or to vilify chaste women. He commanded us to worship Allah alone without associating anyone with him. He ordered us to pray, to fast and to pay the poor their due. We acknowledged he was Allah's messenger and believed in him. We followed him in whatever he bought from Allah and we worshipped the only one God without associating anything with him. We treated as unlawful what he forbade and embraced what he made lawful for us. At this, our people were estranged. They persecuted us, tried to seduce us from our faith and force us to return to idolatry, pressing us to return to the abominations we used to commit earlier. When they tortured us, ground us under their tyranny and stood between us and our religion, we fled to your country, choosing you above others for refuge. We have come here, O king, to your country, seeking your protection. We hope that we shall not be dealt with unjustly. The king listened patiently to Jafar when he asked Jafar if he could recite something that had been revealed to Muhammad, peace be upon him. Jafar then recited the opening verses of Surah Maryam, named after Mary, the mother of Jesus. The king wept until tears flowed to his beard and the bishops were also overcome. Truthfully, this and what Jesus bought are from the same divine light. Then turning to the envoys of the Quraysh, the king said, You may go. By God, I shall never give them to you, nor will they be ill-treated. The two envoys from the Quraysh now changed their tactics. The next day, they returned to the king's court and made another attempt to convince the king to expel the Muslims from his country. Amr tried to incite the king against the Muslims. O king, they assert a dreadful thing about Jesus, which is too shameful to be repeated before you. The king again summoned the Muslims to his court and questioned them about their belief regarding Jesus. Jafar bin Abi Talib replied, We say about him that which our prophet, peace be upon him, has taught us. Jesus was a human being and Allah's prophet. He was a spirit and a word cast unto the Blessed Virgin Maryam. The king took a straw from the ground and said, By God, Jesus, the son of Mary, does not exceed what you have said by the length of this straw. Go and live in my territory, in peace and security. Those who ill-treat you will be punished. I shall not give you any trouble, even if I were offered a mountain of gold in exchange. The king then ordered that all the gifts bought by the envoys from the Quraysh be returned. Having failed miserably, the two envoys left for Arabia in great shame.
the Quraysh were very angry about what happened in Abyssinia. They had been mocked in the king's court and the name of their tribe had been tarnished, all because of a small band of refugees. The Muslims, they determined, would pay for this with their blood. Yet how were they be to avenge for this humiliation? Abu Talib was steadfast in his support for his nephew, no matter how hard the Quraysh tried to manipulate him. With his uncle's protection, the Prophet, peace be upon him, continued with his mission. The Quraysh tried everything to destroy Islam. Persecution, assassination, bribery, debate and even compromise. Nothing worked. The defeat the pagans suffered at the Abyssinian court gave them further cause to hate Islam. Naturally, they took out their frustrations on the Muslims who still lived in Makkah. Once, Atiba bin Abi Lahab, who at this point was divorced from the Prophet peace be upon him's daughter, Umm Gulthum, came to the Prophet peace be upon him and quoted a verse from Surah Al-Najm, only to say, I disbelieve in the one who revealed this verse. He reiterated that although the Quraysh had prostrated along with the Prophet, peace be upon him, after a recitation of this surah, they clung to their disbelief in the divine source of Muhammad, peace be upon him's prophethood, and of the revelations he received. From this point onward, Atiba became a constant source of irritation for the Prophet, peace be upon him. He once tore the Prophet, peace be upon him's clothes, and spat in his face. O oh Allah, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said in response, set one of your dogs on him. Soon after that, Atiba went to Syria along with a caravan. When the caravan halted at Zarqa, a lion began to circle him. Atiba panicked and cried, By God, it will devour me, just as Muhammad, peace be upon him, prayed. I am in Syria and he is in Makkah, but he will still kill me. When they went to sleep that night, the other members of the caravan let Atiba sleep in the middle. Despite this arrangement, the lion passed by the camels and other men and pounced on Atiba. He took his head in its jaws and killed him on the spot. One enemy was vanquished. Others remained to plague the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayt, who had placed the camel intestines on the Prophet, peace be upon him's back, once saw the Prophet, peace be upon him, praying and waited for him to place his forehead on the ground. He then placed his foot on the Prophet, peace be upon him's neck and pressed down with all his weight until the Prophet, peace be upon him's eyes, bulged. Finally, when nothing seemed to deter the Prophet, peace be upon him, from accomplishing his mission, the pagans began to think seriously about assassinating him. They were willing to do this, although it could lead to great bloodshed. Abu Jal rose before the Quraysh one day and proclaimed, You all see that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is forever devoted to denouncing our forefathers, calling us ignorant and backward and insulting our gods. Therefore I give my word to Allah that one day I shall lie in wait for him with a heavy stone. When he prostrates, I will crush his head. Following this, you may save me or leave me at the mercy of Banu Abdul Munaf. The people then assured him, By God, we will never abandon you, do whatever you like. The people then assured him, By God, we will never abandon you, do whatever you like. Abu Jal was quick to take full advantage of his followers' loyalty. The next morning, he found a heavy stone and waited for his victim to arrive. The Prophet, peace be upon him, came to the Kaaba as usual and began to perform his prayers. Sitting in groups around the Kaaba, the Quraysh eagerly waited for Abu Jal to carry out his plan. Abu Jal edged forward to where the Prophet, peace be upon him, stood in prayer. However, just as he was about to close in on his victim, he suddenly turned and fled from the scene. The Quraysh grabbed Abu Jal and found his face flushed, his eyes vacant and his hands still gripping the stone. Eventually, he calmed down and released the stone. The Quraysh said, Abu Haqam, what happened to you? I was going to carry out my promise, Abu Jal explained, but a camel appeared before me. By God, I have never seen such skull, neck and teeth and it was about to devour me. The Prophet, peace be upon him, later said that the vision Abu Jal saw was actually Jibreel, peace be upon him. Others among the Quraysh, however, were undeterred by Abu Jal's experience. When a group of Quraysh saw the Prophet, peace be upon him, circumambulating the Kaaba in worship, they began to make loud, satirical remarks about him. Encouraged by the fact that he seemed hurt by these remarks, they insulted him again, a second time, and a third time. Finally, the Prophet, peace be upon him, stopped and facing them said, O people of Quraysh, 
Do you hear? I swear, by the one in whose hands lies my life, I have come to you with a great slaughter. The prophet's words weighed very heavily on those who had been taunting him. They fell silent for a while and then tried to calm him by speaking kind words to him. The next day, the same group of people assembled at the Kaaba and began talking about the Prophet, peace be upon him. A few moments later, the Prophet, peace be upon him, appeared and they all rushed towards him in rabid anger. Putting on his clothes, they asked, Are you the one who orders us to stop worshipping the gods of our forefathers? The Prophet, peace be upon him, was not intimidated. Yes, I am. The mob surrounded him on all sides and some began pushing and shoving him from side to side while others shouted our insults. Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayt caught hold of a cloth hanging from around his neck and began choking the Prophet, peace be upon him. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, heard the commotion and ran to defend him. He seized Uqba by his shoulders and pulled him off the Prophet, peace be upon him. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, tore each man away from the Prophet, peace be upon him, crying, Woe to you! Would you kill a man simply because he says that Allah is his Lord? Now the mob turned on Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, and let the Prophet, peace be upon him, go. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, paid a great price for rescuing the Prophet, peace be upon him. The mob beat him violently and his face was so battered that his nose was indistinguishable from his face. The people from Abu Taim wrapped him up and took him to his house. They were sure that he would not live to see the next day. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, however, survived the assault. That evening, he asked about the Prophet, peace be upon him. The people of Banu Taim rebuked him for his stubborn loyalty to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and went away. Unconcerned about his own health, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, refused food and drink, insistent on seeing the Prophet, peace be upon him, to make sure he was alive and well. Finally. In the still darkness, he was taken to the Prophet, peace be upon him, in Dar al-Arqam. There he saw the Prophet, peace be upon him, and only then did he eat and drink. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, suffered more and more at the hands of the Meccan pagans until he decided to migrate to Abyssinia. With this intention, he left Mecca and headed for what had become a place of refuge for Muslims. When he reached Bak Gimad, he happened to meet Malik bin Dugunna, the leader of Qara, and Ahabish. Malik asked him why he had left Makkah. When Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, told him he was migrating to Abyssinia, Malik voiced his disapproval. A man like you cannot be expelled. You help the destitute. You keep good relations with your family. You bear the burdens of the helpless. You are hospitable with guests, and you comfort those who suffer for the sake of truth. I pledge to protect you. Come along with me and pray to your Lord in your city. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, accepted Malik's pledge of protection and both men journeyed back to Makkah. Malik bin Dughunna then announced that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was under his protection. The Quraysh accepted his pledge of safety for Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, on a condition that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, would pray only inside his house so that no one would see him. The pagans feared that their women, children and more impressionable members would be influenced by such an open show of Islam. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, abided by this stipulation for a while. He later made for himself a prayer area in his courtyard and where he started praying and reciting the Qur'an in the open. When Ibn Dughunna learned of this, he reminded him of the condition under which he had pledged him safety. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then released him from his pledge, saying, I am agreeable to the protection and guarantee of my Lord. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was not only devout but also tender-hearted. The Qur'an, with its promise of reward and punishment, its description of Allah's creation and its narratives about previous prophets, moved him to tears. As he recited its verses, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, would weep. Women and children would crowd around, watching in amazement at this show of emotion over the Qur'an. The men of Quraysh were not able to tolerate this display for long and renewed their resolve to harass him. Not all the Muckans, however, took such a harsh view of Islam. Even the pillars of pagan society found their stony hearts crumbling when in solitude they considered the Prophet, peace be upon him's message. They were no less impressed by his courage in standing up to the Quraysh and his enduring patience.
Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Umar bin Khattab, may Allah be pleased with them both, were two such people, and their conversions marked a turning point in the short history of Islam.